We're in Isaiah chapter 14. We will be reading verse 13 in just a little bit. The title of this study is The Limitations of So-Called Free Speech. Uh, this past week we have celebrated the 200th anniversary of the writing of our Constitution and uh, the Bill of Rights, which is the first ten amendments of the Constitution. And uh, there are things that guarantee us the privilege of assembling ourselves together as uh, we are this evening for the purpose of studying the Word of God. And it is um, so important that we do that. So these Bill of Rights encompass what we claim to be so-called human rights, especially within the borders of our nation and um, abroad, but especially within our nation. The very first amendment that we have says this, Congress shall make no law respecting an establishment of religion, prohibiting the free exercise thereof, or abridging the freedom of speech or of the press, or the right of the people to peaceably assemble and petition the government for redress of grievances. Now, I want to focus in especially on one segment of that First Amendment. Congress shall make no law abridging the freedom of speech or of the press. Now, some have taken this to be sort of a carte blanche, you know, a, an open-ended statement that that means that anybody can say anything about anyone else at any time without ever <laughs> being responsible for their remarks. Uh, like they can tell lies or gossip and that sort of thing and just simply get away with it, calling the, on the First Amendment right of free speech as a reason as to why they can do that. Now, obviously, when our founding fathers wrote this First Amendment, they did not mean freedom of speech apart from, <coughs> apart from responsibility or accountability. If that's true, what is responsible journalism? Can anybody print anything they want to without being sued for liable? Can anybody get on television and make a false report about another individual or about an event or a happening? No, of course they can't. Well, that means that their speech is limited then. And of course it is. That's what responsible journalism is. It is reporting the facts. The problem today is that we have too many of our news people and anchors that are interpreters of modern history instead of reporters of the plain facts. Secondly, if that's true, then what is being held liable? Liable simply means that you are responsible for any loss that you have caused to the other person, like a loss of reputation, a loss of business because of your false comments. If that is true, that there are no laws of freedom of speech, that it's not to be curtailed in a responsible manner, then what is defamation of character? Of course, you cannot just make slanderous remarks about another individual if it's not true, and even then you don't go trumpeting their sinfulness on uh, the street corner or town square. That's defamation of character. If it's true that there are no restrictions to free speech, then what is perjury? Why do you swear to tell the truth, nothing but the truth, so help you God? You see, because there is a limitation on what you can say in a court of law. But the problem is people do not translate that into their everyday lives. Assumed honesty is what each has one individual to another. We simply assume that if you're telling us you're stating the facts, uh, so help you God, you're telling the truth. If there's no abridgment of speech, then what is perjury? Fifthly, if there's no abridgment of speech, what is slandering? Now, slandering means to utter a tale maliciously. 
And it's exactly what the devil does. He is called the slanderer or the accuser of the brethren. And he comes to the presence of God uh, each and every day and says, well, what about this one and what about the other one? He's the accuser of the brother. He, brother, he is the great slanderer. But on the other hand, maligning somebody means to bring about an evil effect. You're trying to bring about something good in your life apart from God, but you're playing God by pronouncing judgment on another person unfairly. Maligning a person's character means to be evil, bring about an evil effect, or playing God apart from God. What is vituperation? It's simply to outshout the other person. Somebody's giving a speech, and you draw a crowd there of dissenters, and they start shouting so that you cannot be heard. Now, I guarantee you that our founding fathers did not mean, uh, for example, if somebody's speaking on uh, uh, out against homosexuality, for someone else to draw a crowd of homosexuals and then to come in there and throw eggs and tomatoes and outshout the fellow that's talking. Uh uh. Free speech does not guarantee that they have a right to do that. That's vituperation, and it's wrong. Lastly, if there is no abridgment of speech, then how come there are laws against inciting to riot? What if we were in a church uh, uh, on a, a Sunday evening, say, over on the east side, and there's a packed house, and the, and the soprano, as Max has said, is all the way up to the top, and she's a star, and all of a sudden somebody shows up and says, there's a bomb in here, and yells it to the top of his lungs. Or there's a fire, everybody out, and there's a, a riot. Are we allowed to do that? Well, no. Well, then, that's not exactly free speech, then, is it? No, it's not. Now, I am not cutting down the First Amendment. I'm simply cutting down the interpretation of the First Amendment that most people have. It does not mean freedom from responsibility or accountability. Otherwise, these other terms are, um, are mere falderall. In God's system, there never was, there never has been, there never will be any such thing as freedom of speech. That is, in the sense of being unrestrained or ungoverned. Anytime you speak, you're to tell the truth. Oh, that, that opens up a whole new light, isn't it? It doesn't mean you can say anything you want to at any time about anyone or anything. When you talk, you speak the truth one to another. Paul said, lie not one to another. Therefore, speech is always channeled and it is always limited by the truth and for the truth. So it's important that we understand these things because I guarantee you, what I'm telling you this evening, the world in general does not understand. It is always in God's system attached to two things, responsibility and accountability. If you say it, you're responsible for it and you're accountable for the consequences personally. Now, the first dissident against the, um, <laughs> this system of limited and restrained and channeled and responsible speech is Lucifer. He is the first one who said, I can say and I can think anything I want to, God, and you're not going to stop me. Now, we find that in verse number 13 of Isaiah 14. And there he said, now notice it's speaking. He's speaking in his heart. So both speaking and thinking are one and the same as far as God is concerned. Jesus said, it's not the things that a man takes in the mouth that goes into the belly that defile the man. It's the things that are in the heart that come out of the mouth that defile the man. That's thinking, that's attitude, that's condition of soul, that's verbal communication. Those have the potential of defiling a man. Therefore, he said in, in the book of Proverbs, keep your heart with all diligence. That's channeled speech. That's limited speech. For out of it are the issues of life. So again, we see that no such thing in God's system is free speech in the sense of being unrestrained or ungoverned. Now, he said, God is speaking here, for you, Lucifer, 
have said in your heart. And the word said there is this word in the Hebrew, amar. And it means to speak with force or intent to accomplish a purpose. Now this is very, very important because I'm going to show you what, what um, sin is in speaking in just a little bit. And it has to do with intent. So when he said in his heart, he spoke. Was he allowed to speak? No. The minute he spoke, God said, the multitude of iniquities has, de has defiled the midst of you and filled the midst of you with violence. There was a, a reaction in his heart. Something happened there when he thought these thoughts with intent of carrying them out. So when you have something that is thought, that is coupled with purpose or intent, that is an absolute sin unless it's the right thought and the right intent of heart. All right. Now, in this particular case, it is in the cow perfect which means that it was an action that was completed in the past with results that continue on. There was a point in time, how perfect, when Lucifer said, I'm going to do it, and the action is complete. He chose totally against God when he said this in his heart. So the action, as far as its results, remains forever. Now, this is the difference, as I said, between temptation and and sin. Temptation is entertaining the thought. Sin is grasping it with your will. Now we're going to see this in just a little bit as we turn to the book of James. James chapter 1 verse 15. So this is how you're going to know when you're doing wrong. It's one thing to think it and then say, no, I reject thinking it. I will not have that attitude toward that person, that event. I, will, I, will, I reject this thought. Or I accept it and I'm going to do something about it. Whether it's in your heart, as was with Lucifer, or whether you speak it outwardly, the, the same is true. The same uh, you are held uh, uh, accountable to God in the same fashion. Now, verse, verse number 14, but every man is tempted when he is drawn away of his own lust and enticed. Now, that's temptation. But temptation is not sin if you turn from it or reject it. But when, when and if lust has conceived, it brings forth sin. And the word conceived is sulambano. Soon is the prefix meaning together with, lambano means to grasp, and in this case it means to clasp together as a pregnancy. When sperm and egg come together and they clasp, they unite, there's the penetration there, and they are together forever, and that's what it means, to, to get the two and clasp them together forever. Now, turn with me, if you will, Let's finish reading this verse and turn with me to the book of Hebrews. So when lust has conceived, it brings forth sin, and sin, when it is finished, brings forth death. All right, let's go to Hebrews 4. And look at verse number 12. For the word of God is quick and powerful, sharpened than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the dividing asunder of soul and spirit, joints and marrow, and is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. Now you will remember that in the frontal part of your soul, that's where you do your thinking. In the back part, that's where you do your weighing of the thoughts. Intents have to do with what goes on in your conscience or what is lawful, and thoughts have to do with what is lustful, because you remember this is, you have to weigh as to whether they're lustful or not. This is where your emotions are located. This is where your standards are located. 
Now, you can have a thought in your heart here and not sin. You can have a wrong thought and dismiss it. That's the implication here. But if you go back to James where it says sulambano, to clasp together, when the will brings the two together and you justify your actions and you let your emotions grab a hold of your will and your will simply sear your conscience and then you go right ahead and bring, it, bring this all the way forward and you think that thought and then later on perhaps speak it or carry out the, the wrong intent, that's when it's wrong. When your will conceives or brings together the two. Yes, it's fine for me to do this. I don't care what God says about it. I'm justified in my, my own sight. And so you bring together the two. And that's what it means here. Literally in the aorist participle, it means to cause a particular event or entity to come into existence. Now, where have we heard this type of thing before? Jesus Christ stepped out of nothing and said, let there be light. He created. Let there be the world. Let there be angels. Let there be man. This is the exact same concept where he brings the intent of his heart. Now, this is the legitimate intent to what he knows, thinking, and, and, and simply connects the two, and with his will, creates. So what we're talking about here is creating something in the soul. What are you creating when you speak wrongly or think wrongly? You are creating an entity that is called evil because you're trying to get the best out of life to your favor apart from God. That is the most basic philosophy of evil. You have a thought. You immediately cycle it back here to your uh, conscience, and your conscience says, that's fine. Uh, even though it might be wrong, you're justified in doing it. You're justified in speaking wrong about that person or telling a lie about yourself, how great you are and building yourself up and so forth. And it comes down here and your lust grabs a hold of that thought and your will brings the two together. And so you either think it in your heart or speak it outwardly. And that absolutely is sin. That's why it says the word of God discerns between the two, the thoughts and the intent. And that's why James says when sin is conceived, when lust is conceived with the will, bringing the two together and justifying your actions by yourself apart from God, that is sin. All right. Now we're going to talk about three things very quickly as we go back to Genesis again. Genesis chapter 3. Now, we're going to look at three things, and then we're going to wrap it up. First of all, we're going to look at Lucifer's innuendo. We're going to see what that is. Secondly, we're going to see that he told an intentional untruth. Thirdly, we're going to see that he told something that would be termed an insinuation. Now, what is an innu innuendo? It is an indirect intimation of a derogatory nature. An indirect intimation of a derogatory nature. In other words, um, you're, you're going to say something and you're not going to directly cut down this person, but you're going to imply it, that there's something wrong with this person. That's what Lucifer does, and that's what a lie is, and that's why there is no such thing as free speech. Innuendos are outlawed in, uh, in God's system as far as illegitimate uh, innuendos as such. All right, it's seen in the word subtle. 
Now the serpent was more subtle than any beast of the field. And he said unto the woman, Yea, hath God said, Ye shall not eat of every tree of the garden. Okay, here's the innuendo part of it. Subtle. It is the Hebrew, arum. What does that mean? It means one thing, cunning by design, and secondly, it means devised so as to be difficult to grasp. All right, again, what does subtle mean? It means cunning by design. And then, so devised, so as to be difficult to grasp. Now, we go back to the creative nature of the serpent. Now, at first, this was simply a protective element for the beast itself. But, when Lucifer used it, he used what was natural to the beast in an unnatural way to accomplish his purpose. Now, re please remember, he used what was natural to the beast in an unnatural way to accomplish his purpose. There's where the subtlety is. You see, he uses people who are naturally eloquent. He uses people who can who, uh, naturally attract a crowd, who are charismatic figures. You know, uh, think of all the uh, uh, figures that have attracted the large crowds even today. And we could say, man alive, they've got uh, thousands of that church, hundreds of this church. He's got a million followers. They're charismatic figures. It's natural. Boy, they can really speak. Think of Hitler. I mean, you talk about charisma. He was a nothing. And with this uh, whatever magical power, demon possession, what have you, he had this charisma to absolutely change the world at that time, change the thinking of a large segment of the world. It's cunning by design, designed or devised rather to be difficult to grasp. Yeah, he's got a point. It doesn't seem right, but yeah, maybe it does seem right. It's difficult to, to catch him at something, and that's what this means. Do you ever try to catch a snake? <laughs> well, what do you have to do? Well, you grab hold of it, and it's slippery. And it's also tapered, so that the more that you squeeze, what happens? It slips out of your fingers. Uh, if you stomp on its tail, it'll come right back at you. <laughs> you, you ha there's only one way to get a snake. Verse number 15. I'll put enmity between thee and the woman, thy seed and her seed. It's going to bruise, it shall bruise thy head. The only way is to smash its head or catch it by the head. And that's the whole point here. If you're ever going to defeat the serpent, you've got to face him eyeball to eyeball, and you've got to smash him in the brains. It's your thinking. His thinking and saying his speech against your speech. That's the point of Bible doctrine, inculcated Bible doctrine. And again, this would be about the 150th, millionth, billionth time I've said it. Make these stones bread. Thou shalt not live by bread alone. That is the essence of why we need doctrine in the soul to give it out. It actually is a uh, categorical refutation of the wrong speech of Lucifer. Now, the innuendo was, was simply this, uh, that, that God had made statements and he was talking out of both sides of his mouth. Actually, the serpent was talking out of both sides of his mouth. That's why he's got a forked tongue. That's why the Indians used a forked tongue, talking out of both sides of your mouth. The innuendo is, well, yeah, he's God, but uh, he's really meaning or saying something else. Now, one more thing about this. The snake is devised so as to be difficult to grasp. He's cunning by design. One more thing about this. He doesn't have any edges. It is extremely hard to catch him. He smooths. Or we could say that he's got a foolproof, almost a foolproof defense system. That's why it is so difficult. And uh, that's why I insist, this is a personal note here, 
I insist that a religious leader is either telling the truth or he's speaking out of both sides of his mouth. He is either telling the truth or he's a false prophet. Get it? Not free speech. He's telling a falsehood and he's telling a lie. Now, what did Lucifer say? Yea, hath God said, ye shall not eat of every tree of the garden. Here's the innuendo. It's just like the old question. I must hurry here. Are you still beating your wife? Well, if you say yes, you're in trouble. If you say no, it implies you were. What do you have to do to a question like that where there is an innuendo? Well, it takes two things, a categorical denial and further explanation as to the truth. It can't be answered with a simple yes or no. And that's what he's doing here. He is getting down to the nitty-gritty of what she knows by way of substance. Not just simply yes or no, but a categorical denial with further uh, evidence as to truth. So, he says, yay. <laughs> Don't you see, he's hanging from this tree. She comes walking by, and here's this serpent. He's hanging down there. He says, yay. <laughs> it's good old English. Actually, what he said was this. Oh, key. That's what he said. And off is a word of access. And you know what it, it's what it says? Anybody that's ever watched Magnum knows this. You know, Magnum will be driving down the road and it'll be silent. And then all of a sudden he says, I know what you're thinking. Have you ever heard him say that? You're not. I, I, it's not that I watch Magnum, but I pick up on, on certain things that people say throughout the movies and that sort of thing. I know what you're thinking. And you watch the next show about midway through. I know what you're thinking. That's what off means. Here she comes strolling and she's looking at the tree. And he says, I know what you're thinking. It's a word of access. It's an icebreaker. It's to get involved in a conversation here. So, the next part of af means, I know what you're thinking, and it's hard to believe, isn't it? Hmm, that's what it means. Hard to believe, isn't it? I know what you're thinking, that this big, beautiful tree that God has, God has actually restricted eating of the tree. Secondly, the word key is a word of source, which means, I know what you're thinking, and it's hard to believe that God would be the source of what? Saying that you'll not eat of every tree of the garden. Did he say that? No. So how is she to answer? Well, she's going to have to tell him the truth, and she simply adds to the truth uh, of God's word in verse number two, where it says, the woman said unto the serpent, We may eat of the fruit of the trees of the garden, but of the fruit of the tree which is in the midst of the garden, God has said, You shall not eat it. Now, up to that point, she was telling the truth, but now she added to the truth. And God forbids free speech. How do we know? Hold your place and turn to the book of, of Revelation. Last chapter. 22, 19. You can't add to or take away from the word of God. You do not have free speech or the right to do that. Revelation 22, 19. And if any man shall take away from the words of the book of this prophecy, God shall take away his part out of the book of life and out of the holy city and the things which are written therein. Verse 18. If any man shall add to these things, God shall add to him the plagues that are written in this book. Did God add to Eve the plagues of the cursed uh, body and environment and the rest? He sure did. Why? Because she added to the word of God. She was not free. There's no such thing as free speech in God's system. You tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, so help you God, or, or you're wrong. You're out of bounds as far as he's concerned. And she added to the word, neither shall ye touch it, lest ye die. She fell for his innuendo. You see, he's indirectly saying that um, God's talking out of both sides of his mouth, when in actuality he was. He was casting doubt and a shadow upon God's character and God's virtue. All right. 
we're back in Genesis chapter 3 again. Let's um, quickly look at the unintentional truth. Uh, excuse me, the unintentional. <laughs> the intentional untruth. And it's written before me and I'm speaking it and I'm not saying what's on there. I'm not telling a lie. I'm just misrepresenting what's there. <laughs> oh boy. <coughs> the intentional untruth. Verse number four. The serpent said to the woman, ye shall not surely die. That is a categorical denial of verse 17 chapter 2 last part in the day that you eat thereof you shall surely die surely die says god not surely die that is an absolute lie it's a blatant lie now what is a lie it is a false statement with intent to deceive one can be in error and not mean to lie but when you lie you know the truth, but you're covering up for the purposes of your own benefit. And that's where religious leaders are today. They know the difference, and yet they have vested interest in telling deceitful things. Now we can find out about this, and I'm going to have to hurry, in, in 2 Corinthians. 2 Corinthians chapter 11. 2 Corinthians chapter 11, verse number 3. <coughs> but I fear lest by any means as the serpent beguiled Eve. And this is a reference to his intentional untruth. Through his subtlety, that's the first part, the innuendo. He had to do the one to get the opportunity to do the other. He gave the innuendo, now he told the untruth. A blatant categorical denial of the truth of what God had taught. But I fear lest any means as the serpent beguiled Eve through his subtlety, so your mind should be corrupted from the simplicity that is in Christ. That's why if you're going to talk about religious matters, it must be the truth or you're on dangerous ground as far as God is concerned. I wouldn't want to be in the shoes of some of these so-called ministers and clergy who are teaching wrong and the people who fall prey to their beliefs. What is gal? It's um, ex apa tao. Okay? We saw this word last time. Ex is simply the preposition ek, which means uh, out of the innermost part and so forth. Apa tao means uh, de it's deceitful because it is delightful. And you'll remember we gave the illustration of, um, of laughing gas. Uh, he's got to make you delighted before he drills on you. It's, it's pleasure more than normal to cover up pain more than normal. And so that's what he did. He, he appealed to her emotions in this area, the thoughts, and so he absolutely seared her conscience in this area, the intents, and her will said, yes, I'm going to sear my conscience and I'm going to let my emotions take over. And the thought that I have of being like God apart from God appeals to me. And human arrogance, lust, took over. And that's what it means to be beguiled. To absolutely wholly seduce due to pleasure and feelings. Now, let's, um, let's go back to Genesis 3 real quickly. Then we're going to go to another portion of Scripture here. Here's the insinuation. Verse 5. First he said, it's hard to believe that God really said that he shouldn't eat of any of the trees. Well, he didn't say that, the woman said. But uh, he did say that you don't even touch it lest you die. She added to the word. Then he told an untruth, categorically denying what God had said. You're not going to surely die. 
Now he's giving an insinuation. Now what is an insinuation? It's something that is said about another person to ingratiate yourself or get on the good side of the person that you're with. You say, nah, you know, they're no good. Now, again, I'm, I'm talking about blatant lies. You have to understand that there are some people you have to say things about. No, we don't have fellowship with them because that's, that's the way they are. They're no good. But in this case, he's talking about God, and God was perfectly good, but he insinuated that he was withholding something. God doth know in the day that ye eat thereof, your eyes will be open, knowing good and evil. He's keeping something from you. That's the insinuation. He's not a good God. He's a bad God. He knows that if you, he lets you eat of that fruit, you're going to be just like he is. Well, that is a, an appeal to the sensual pleasures, and it's an appeal to worldliness. Let me show you. Uh, we're going to quickly go here to another portion uh, after we look at verse 6. One, the tree was good for food. Okay? Verse 6. Two, it was pleasant to the eyes. Follow with me. Three, it says, desired to make one wise. All right? Three things about that tree. Now, it's important because we're going to see right now where the world is and why there's no such thing as free speech and why you have a pastor that snorts and stomps, pounds the pulpit, uh, hits the ground about holidays like Christmas. Did, you know, is he a Scrooge? No, he's not. Um, is he bah humbugging because he's uh, 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 pinching pennies? No, that's not true either. Why does he do it? It's because everything religious apart from the Word of God is an innuendo, a blatant lie, and it's an insinuation that God's really withholding the best from you if He doesn't give you what the world classifies as good. If He withholds that from you, this beautiful fruit, He's not a good God. If He withholds presence, if He withholds this, that, and the other. All right, turn to 1 John. Please, um, please hurry. 1 John chapter 2, verse 15. Love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. If any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, lust of the flesh. What does that coordinate with? It was good for food. Lust of the flesh, you see? Yes, it's true. That was good for food. But God said that it had a curse. Don't eat that fruit. But the world wants what God tells them not to have. They want free speech or un, um, unrestrained or ungoverned thinking. Pleasant to the eyes, note chapter uh, 2, verse 16. The lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes. It's worldliness. There's no such thing as free speech. It's worldliness. And he was implying that God was, he was insinuating that God was withholding something from them. Yes, he was. What was he withholding? The lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and lastly, the pride of life. Desired to be wise. That's the pride of life. What do young people uh, constantly get uh, placed before them at Christmas? Blatant materialism. It's more important to have, to have, to have, to have, to have this. It's the, it's the lust of the flesh. That's going to satisfy me when it's only God who satisfies me. Uh, uh, that's going to satisfy my eyes as I see the brilliance and the tinsel and the lights and the rest of it. When well, the Bible says that the eye is not satisfied with seeing nor the ear with hearing. But it's God. I shall be satisfied, says David, when I shall awake in his presence and see his likeness. Oh, that's a different story. Now, we've got to, desired to make one wise. Arrogant, I'm my, the master of my own fate. And John says it's the pride of life. It's worldliness, pure and simple. We're pure and they're simple. All right. Hopefully that's the case. 
I'm sorry, that's something that Pastor Moki used to always say. Um, he had introduced himself and then he introduced me and say, we, they call us pure and simple, I'm pure and he's he simple. Okay. <laughs> Revelation chapter 22, our last portion. We have a few minutes left. 22 verse number 15. Now, as you're turning there in Revelation 22, 15, I uh, had someone this past week to ask me a question. This will sort of get your mind off of the one, then we'll bring it back to the other. Uh, because I, I couldn't answer it. He said, what do the Australian Aborigines call a boomerang that will not return? Yes, that's true. A stick. <laughs> I said, you, you got me. That's a good one. Okay. <laughs> All right. Revelation chapter 22, verse number 15. This is outside of the gates of heaven. For without our dogs, sorcerers, whoremongers, murderers, idolaters. See, that's why um, we have false prophets and false images of God and whosoever loveth and maketh a lie. Now we're going to look at a couple of Greek words here and then we're done. The word lie is this. P-S-E-U-D-O-S. Pseudos in the Greek. We get our word pseudo from it. What are charismatics? They are people who have pseudo empirical experiences and say I've got the charisma I got it from God charisma charis the gift of God they don't have that it's a pseudo empirical in, uh, experience it's a pseudo emotional experience it's emotional it makes you feel good but again it's the apatao type sin it feels uh, it feels good to cover up something that it's a abnormal uh, pleasure to cover up abnormal pain. What does it mean? Error that is spoken for the purpose of deceit. When a minister gets, gets up behind the sacred desk and says that the message of John the Baptist is the one that's to be preached forever. It will never be out of date, as said their bulletin. That man is uttering pseudos, a lie. And it's for the purpose of, it's spoken for deceit. Why else would you speak it? When plainly the, the apostle Paul tells us that his gospel is for today. Now again, there are degrees of this. There are men who come real close to our position who do not give up baptism and so forth. But, um, but you have to understand, it's pseudos. It's a lie. It's an error spoken to keep people in darkness. Now, who spoke the first lie? Lucifer. Who spoke the second lie? Eve. Who spoke the third lie? Adam. And on and on we go. So much so that um, if you'll just hold your place here and turn to the book of Romans chapter 3 very quickly. I'm, uh, I'm almost out of time. I've, I've gone to preaching half the time and instead of teaching and that's what I get. Chapter 3, Romans, where it says that every man, their throat is an open sepulcher. Verse number 13, Romans 3. With their tongues they have used deceit. The poison of asps is under their lips. Their mouth is full of cursing and bitterness. Verse number four. Let God be true and every man a liar. Unless you're uttering what God says about a, a, a certain subject, you are lying. And it says here in the book, whosoever loveth and maketh a lie is not going to be there. Now, you, of course, if you have believed on the Lord Jesus Christ, you believe the truth, and that's good enough to get you in. But... Uh, you don't want to lie. What do they do? They love lying. Two words and we're done. Quickly. Revelation 22, 15 says, no one that loves lying is going to be there. It means 
to deliberately esteem due to compatibility and commonality. You esteem something. You love it. It's most important to you in your heart and life simply because it's compatible with your own goals and furtherance of your own self and you have that in common with others who want to further themselves apart from God. That's what this so-called free speech is. They love speaking errors to deceive others to use them to further themselves in their goal. They love it. And by the way, it's not uh, agapao, it's phileo. That's the strongest word in the Greek for love. And it means to so highly esteem that, that you and it are one and the same in your soul. And that's where co uh, compatibility comes in. And anybody who is compatible in soul has something in common. You don't want to lie. Lastly, it makes a lie. Poeo. What does that mean? to implement in keeping with life. Poeo is a word meaning poem, and it, and it means to balance with rhyme and reason. It is a poem. Or to so implement in your life that one part of your life is offset with a lie, so it makes the other side lie. Rhyme and reason. One part is a lie, the other part is a lie. You have to tell one lie, and then to cover that up, you have to tell another lie to make it balance out. But then somebody discovers that, or you're pricked in your own heart. Then you've got to tell them tell another lie to make it balance out. And that's the seesaw effect of the those who love to make the lie.